Hello and welcome to Sustainable Finance Week. We'll be bringing together global policy makers, opinion formers and professionals from across private wealth and sustainable finance to discuss private capital, financing sustainability. Congratulations for developing what is now a world-class international event. Business has to change, society has to change, we have to be much more intentional and quicker at addressing environmental and social challenges. I think that is one of the real success stories of Guernsey is that we are already doing that. There's always going to be sort of little things that are different here and there. In fact, there's a lot of like-minded people here who have a common goal. At the cutting edge of impacting the, the climate in the most positive way. The challenges the insurance industry are facing. You think about the amounts of data that an insurer has. What we know about future climate change and how that relates to the insurance industry. What net zero actually means and what it looks like in investment portfolios. You are by accident of fate alive in an absolutely critical moment in the history of our planet. And I think it's so true. I would argue there really isn't any other agenda than this. Well, a good start. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rupert Pleasant. I'm the CEO of Guernsey Finance. Guernsey Finance itself is a joint initiative between the states of Guernsey and the Guernsey financial services industry to connect and promote Guernsey into its strategic uh, target markets. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the first core day of Guernsey Sustainable Finance Week 2022 in association with our media partner, The Financial Times. After one year broadcasting online and one hybrid event, this is the first year where we've been able to fully open our doors to delegates across the globe. Green and sustainable industries are developing rapidly, and as a market leader, we're pleased to be hosting such important discussions today. Before I go on, I'd like you to turn your attention, if you could, to the screen again. Uh, we've got a very special video to open with um, and a very special message of why we're here today. Hello, my name's Rachel Scott and I'm a producer and director at the BBC's Natural History Unit in Bristol. I work alongside Sir David Attenborough on series such as Blue Planet 2 and Frozen Planet 2, which is on air at the moment. I'm also very proud to say that I'm a Guernsey girl and so I'd like to welcome you all to our beautiful island as part of Guernsey's Sustainable Finance Week 2022 and I'm just sorry that I can't be there in person to meet you all. For the series, I was able to travel all over the world to help film. And I think the thing that I found most amazing and surprising about working on this series was the variety and diversity of life found in the frozen parts of our planet, not just in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but in frozen peaks, under the ice in frozen lakes, frozen tundra, deserts and grasslands and the taiga forest. It's been a really amazing series to have been a part of and the reason that we felt that it was time to make the follow up to the original more than 10 years ago is because technology has improved so much in that time we're able to tell stories that we simply wouldn't have been able to tell just a decade ago. But also, these cold parts of our world are changing rapidly because of climate change. And so we wanted to document that change. We, of course, film predominantly natural history, but we also wanted to film the change that was occurring on our watch. And so we filmed the melt from microscope level right up to commandeering satellites to take daily photographs of the Arctic sea ice retreating and the ice on top of the Alps reducing. In the last 40 years alone, half of the Arctic summer sea ice has disappeared and it's predicted that by 2035 it will disappear completely. Just around the corner from us in the Alps, they think that the Alps will be ice free by the turn of the century. Of course, this has a fundamental impact on the life of the animals that live there, but it will also have a huge impact on us. 
we're all responsible for that and we can all make a difference but you in that room today can make a much bigger difference than most your world leaders and sustainable advocates and the conversations and discussions that you might be having this week could really change the planet so thank you for being here and i'd like to share with you a short clip from my episode frozen ocean happy and assured there's a happy ending to that one. <laughs> um, very powerful footage, as I'm sure you'd agree. Um, you can really see the damaging effects of, of climate change. So our massive thanks go to Rachel for her message and also for use of that clip. As she said, all of us in the room can make a huge difference as sustainable advocates and thought leaders. And the conversations we have this week can really help change the planet. Guernsey is a world leader and force for global good through its st strategic commitment to sustainable finance. The island's dedicated green and sustainable finance initiative, Guernsey Green Finance, has been a member of the United Nations Financial Centres for Sustainability since 2018, while the Guernsey Financial Services Commission is a member of the Network for Greening the Financial System and the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. Guernsey is leading the way with the launch in 2018 of the world's first green regulated green fund regime, the Guernsey Green Fund, to provide the certainty of a trusted and transparent product to inspire investor confidence. The regime itself now has net asset value of almost five billion pounds under management, so a great success. Having introduced green private equity principles in 2020 and launching an ESG insurance kite mark, the island has been at the forefront of solving the climate crisis. The GFSE also consulted on the feasibility of a natural capital fund kite mark, which will be discussed a little later today. These are just some of the highlights of the many collaborations the island has with notable green finance bodies and of the world first the island has achieved. We're also delighted to launch our new report this week in association with Beringa Partners, Private Finance and its role in supporting the transition to net zero which identifies the vital role that the financial services industry can play in achieving a just transition to a net zero future. This will be discussed in more detail tomorrow and we'll provide details later of how you can access this report in full. I'm delighted to say that we have a packed schedule for this year. Each day this week we will focus on a key theme as outlined in our 2022 Green Strategy Report, developed in consultation with the island's finance industry and internationally through discussions and participations with green and sustainable finance global leaders and associations including UN, FC4S and discussions at COP26. Obviously we're holding this event in the shadow of extremely sad news for the United Kingdom and the rest of the world following the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II on the 8th of September. Part of her vast legacy will be her love for the environment and preserving it for future generations. She herself gave a speech at COP26 last year and her son, our new king, His Majesty Charles III, sent his best wishes to Guernsey for a successful Sustainable Finance Week last year and His Majesty's Sustainable Markets Initiative video was played to open the event. We're proud to be playing our part in an issue that meant so much to Her Majesty and to her family as well. Today, we're looking at biodiversity, exploring its role in the race to zero, emerging business models that show the investable and bankable proposition, assessment methodologies for biodiversity gain, trends in reporting, and the role of private wealth and institutional capital in accelerating change. We have a packed schedule of speeches, presentations, and panel discussions led by expert thinkers and innovators in the world of sustainable finance. We'll be covering the event live on our social media channels via our dedicated sustainable finance Twitter page at Guernsey Green Finance. Feel free to engage with us there using the hashtag WeAreSustainable to join the conversation. 
Please note that we won't be taking any questions via Slido today, but we will be doing uh, a number of questions during the GFSC discussion. Sorry, a number of polls during the GFSC discussions. Afterwards, you'll be able to discuss the key takeaways of the day and make new connections over networking and drinks, which will take place in a rather special location with details to follow. Today's headline sponsor is PwC, and we're delighted to have a carbon offset sponsor package for the first time, supported by the International Stock Exchange, headquartered here in Guernsey. Sustainability is built into all aspects of the conference, but this sponsorship enables, enables us to ensure that the event will be carbon neutral. For its international beneficiary, TIES has selected a high-quality, internationally verified offset. The project is the Baum Invest Mixed Reforestation in Costa Rica, which aims to reforest pasture land previously used for extensive cattle ranching in northern Costa Rica, using mixed strands of various indigenous tree, spe tree species as well as teak. Locally, TIES will donate to the Guernsey Conservation Volunteers, who work to conserve Guernsey's natural environment, working on picturesque sites and natural reserves around the island to maintain and enhance the biodiversity of the area. So, let's get started. Uh, my colleague, Stephanie Glover, Guernsey Finance's Head of Strategy and Sustainable Finance, will be linking the sessions throughout the afternoon. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our uh, Sustainable Finance Strategic Advisor, Josephine Bush. Josephine is leading the discussions with our keynote speaker, Emma Howard Boyd. Emma has had an extensive career in financial services at the forefront of the environmental and sustainable finance agenda. Emma chairs the Green Finance Institute in the UK and is former chair of the UK Environment Agency. She's also a UN Global Ambassador for Race to Zero and Race to Resilience. Emma serves on several boards and advisory committees, which include Lion Trust Asset Management, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, the European Climate Foundation, the Council for Sustainable Business, and the Prince's Accounting for, Sus for Sustainability Project. We're honored to welcome Emma to Guernsey. So without any further ado, over to you, Josephine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rupert, for that very kind introduction and welcome everybody to Sustainable Finance Week and Biodiversity Day. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you in person uh, and I'm also really delighted to have this opportunity to facilitate this discussion with Emma and the rest of our panel who will be joining us uh, in just a moment. Uh, so welcome Emma to Guernsey. Thank you. Great to be here. And I've certainly been making the most of all of the natural environment uh, that's to be found on Guernsey. Yeah, well, we'd love to start with that, actually, Emma. So um, could you just share with us what your first impressions of Guernsey are? Well, I arrived on a ferry, which was fantastic. Uh, really great to be arriving on slow travel. Uh, and I've made the most of cycling a little bit around the island, swimming in the sea. I went over to Herm this morning. So absolutely wonderful to see the rich environment that Guernsey offers to its locals, but also to guests like me, and certainly planning ways to come back. Fantastic. Well, look, today is all about biodiversity, um, the business opportunity, but also looking at risks and challenges. Um, I thought a good place to start would be to put biodiversity into context, and why in particular we're looking at biodiversity now more than ever. Biodiversity, nature, I mean, fantastic to see that footage that Rachel showed us. And I'm going to start off with a quote, a favourite quote of mine, from an event that was hosted ahead of COP26 in February 2020 at the Guildhall. And it was David Attenborough who said the following to an audience of the great and the good from the city of London. And he said, I make no pretense to understand the complexities of the global financial system, but in a lifetime of observing the natural world, I do have some understanding of the equally complex natural systems that underpin our civilizations and trade. And I can tell you, 
firsthand that those systems are collapsing and anything built upon their assumed future stability is on very shaky foundations indeed. The context of that February, and in fact the day before, because in my former role as chair of the Environment Agency, one of the things we had responsibility for in England was flooding, was standing on a bridge over the River Severn, which was roaring. One of, the local, one of our local team who's worked on the River Severn for decades said to me, she is very angry. They all refer to rivers in the feminine. And they, he said to me, I have never seen her as angry as the uh, roaring, the raging, the flooding that we was, saw back in mm. February 2020. And if we just think of some of the events that we've seen around the world, mm. and it's been an extraordinary summer, it com continues to be an extraordinary year for weather events. We've all had our news coverage focused on the very sad event of the Queen dying. I don't know how many of you are aware of the significant cyclone that hit Japan. Nine million people being evacuated. And this is where nature is showing her anger. Mm -hmm. Again, the UN Secretary General in relation to Pakistan has said, we, nature is showing how angry she is mm -hmm. in the context of climate change. And this isn't just um, bad for us from a human, mm -hmm. from a lives and lively perspe livelihoods perspective, but I think has, as David Attenborough expressed, has the opportunity to impact economies and investments as well. And we are at that moment now where we can pivot mm -hmm. into turning that massive risk into an opportunity, but we have very little time left to make mm -hmm. that transition. I think we often, don't we, when we think about sort of biodiversity, we, well, there's been so much focus on climate change uh, and, and carbon emissions, we often forget about biodiversity and biodiversity loss and the interdependency between the two. I mean, when we look at some of the, the data points on uh, biodiversity loss. Um, I was reading since the beginning of civilization, the world has lost half of its forests, um, half of its coral reefs, 70% of its wetlands, and we've dammed two thirds of our world rivers. Wildlife has declined by 60% since 1970, um, and we're at risk of losing over 1 million species. Um, it's quite shocking, isn't it, when we look at those hard facts uh, that underpin some of this risk now that's being identified, both existential risk and systemic risk within the financial system. And I think this is where we have a huge amount to learn from the way we, in the financial world, are analysing carbon mm -hmm. and having that um, central focus of getting to net zero. We also know, and this has been very much at the forefront of my agenda at the Environment Agency, that we need to adapt to climate change. We need to build resilience. Mm -hmm. and that's where work of uh, initiatives like the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment come in, making sure that we are factoring in, particularly to our infrastructure investments what it means to become resilient, and nature and biodiversity has a massive role to play in both the net zero agenda, again, if we think about mm. peatlands, parts of the ocean storing carbon, mm -hmm. but similarly dampening. If we, if we have mangroves in the sea, that can dampen the storms. If we are looking at nature-based solutions in relation mm. to flooding, mm -hmm. that can make a difference alongside the grey infrastructure. We need the blue and the green infrastructure. Yeah. And I think, again, with biodiversity, with nature, we need to break it down into different subjects as well. So mm -hmm. if we take some of what we've experienced, again, in the UK over the summer, prolonged dry weather, mm -hmm. moving into drought, 
plus heat wave. If you look at global water um, supplies, a stat that I heard in a speech given by Sarah Breeden from the mm -hmm. Bank of England says that uh, water provision is a growing global issue with demand expected to be 40% greater than supply by 2030. Wow. So again, we need to take the complexity of biodiversity and break mm. it down into different ways that it can impact us as mm. humans, but impact our businesses, our supply chains, and ultimately the, our, our investments as well. We have to look at these things hand yeah. in hand. Um, and I have to commend you, Emma, because you've been a huge proponent of the, um, the role of biodiversity in adaption and resilient and really raised its profile um, in your role. Um, the Descupta review on the economics of biodiversity um, suggested that at the core of this, our failure to recognise the value of biodiversity, um, at the heart of that is both institutional and market failure. What would you say to that? I th I, again, I think mm. uh, his analysis as a brilliant uh, economist, brilliant mm. academic, uh, needs to be brought down into practical things we can do both as mm. organizations, business leaders, but investors. And yes, there is market failure, and we do need to work out how we internalize those externalities, how we value biodiversity, ecosystem services, the range of different terms that have been used over mm. the years. I think one of the things that I have found really good about the UK government's green finance strategy is breaking down our thinking, and we can mm. apply this to net zero, but we can also apply this to biodiversity in nature. We need to green the financial system. So what are the mm. things that regulators can do to help green finance, mm -hmm. but we also need to finance green. And by that, I mean, how do we get capital to flow into the projects, into the things that will solve both the climate mm. crisis and the natural environment crisis, and move ultimately, as we head towards net zero, into a nature positive world. Mm. And again, this is where, uh, during my time as chair of the Environment Agency, I was really keen as both the environmental regulator, but also with responsibility mm. for projects to build flood resilience, that we could build those pilot projects mm which ultimately could be fundable, because that is where you can start seeing the advantage of not just public money, government mm. money, going into nature solutions, but also private mm. sector money. And I think a key theme for all of us is collaboration. You need mm. the public sector to work alongside the private sector, and the third sector, those amazing natural environment, environmental organizations. But you also need environmental regulators to work alongside economic regulators and financial regulators. We often have found ourselves swimming in different swim lanes, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that our, as regulators we're talking together to each other and making sure the mechanisms we're putting in place will actually, actually deliver real change on the ground. And could you give us some examples then of where you're starting to see that come together? Yes, yeah, so some fantastic pilot um, studies uh, that were uh, announced probably three or four years ago, a bit of a blur because of the pandemic, but in collaboration with the Department of Environment, the Environment Agency, Triodos Bank, and the Esbe Fairbairn Foundation. So again, that real mixture of public, private, and third sector, four different pilots, one of which is um, based in the north west of England on the River Wire and has already, in a couple of years, led to investment being made to bring about nature-based solutions to flooding with a water company, Floodry, an insurance provider, the Environment Agency and others 
investing, well, providing a service that investors, including at the Esme mm. Fairbairn Foundation, have now g given money to. And mm. it's the first of a scheme that should deliver a return. We've also seen the government, the UK government, um, set up a Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund, otherwise mm. known as NERF. And again, this is about giving grants to different organisations to build the capacity, mm -hmm. the projects that ultimately we hope will be fundable. And these are building year on year mm -hmm. and growing in size, growing in scale, and hopefully will be ultimately able to deliver results and um, rewards to the private sector. And again, it's that combination of environmental groups offering services, businesses that can also benefit and pay for those services, and the private sector and investors coming in to support those projects. And I think we'll mm. see more of those happen. Mm. Um, academics also have a, a, a role to play. The Environment Agency and various groups around Manchester have been in a pro involved in a project called Ignition. Mm. And uh, there is a living lab in Salford where measuring the environmental outcomes uh, from different interventions, whether that's planting trees in streets, which can have an air quality impact or a mm. flooding impact. All of this is building mm. and providing the basis that will ultimately lead to investments. So this, these are great examples of where um, policy and regulation is really igniting the acceleration of capital into um, investable projects. Um, given the funding gap, there's a, I think it's a... F four trillion funding gap we have uh, to invest in biodiversity um, and only about 14 percent of the current 133 billion of spend uh, on biodiversity at the moment only 14 percent is coming from the private um, sector given those examples of policy igniting uh, investment how do we crowd in more private funding what what innovations do we need to really accelerate that I think this is where we are at the start of um, making this big and at the scale that we need. Uh, the Green Finance Institute has a, a project called Hive, which is bringing together all the different case studies that exist around the world. And I think the, the benefit of that, and again, it's funded by the Esme Fairbairn mm -hmm. Foundation, so bringing in philanthropy as well, is to learn to f um, make sure that those ideas, those solutions mm -hmm. are spread as quickly as possible, and that we're learning also from the funding that is happening for climate projects as well, because of that inextricable link. We're seeing organizations like WWF mm -hmm. uh, working around the world with businesses, bringing in this combination mm -hmm. uh, but we all need to put heft and our best effort mm -hmm. behind these projects to make sure that they happen at pace. Because mm -hmm. we cannot, I cannot stress enough how I think around the world, those of us that have been working on the climate agenda, working on the nature recovery agenda, are seeing events play out in the real world much, much sooner mm -hmm. than we anticipated. And things are just speeding up. So we need to apply our best brains and our best investment strategies as quickly as possible. Events like the COPs, COP27 coming up in uh, less than 50 days. We've also got the Nature COP, COP15, taking place now no longer in China, but in Canada in December. Mm -hmm. Those bring the regulatory frameworks together and the business intent as well. I have seen mm -hmm. businesses get behind nature and nature positive in a way mm -hmm. that I haven't seen before. And it feels like it is speeding up. Which is great to hear. I mean, you've talked about some of the international events that uh, you know we've we've read about and seen in the press. Um, you know, developing nations are home to some of our obviously richest natural resources, um, but they're also disproportionately impacted by by biodiversity loss and, and climate change more generally. Um, how do you think that we? Uh, or global governments actually should work together more effectively to devise policies that benefit the developing nations? 
Well, I think that will be a discussion that's playing out this week in New York with the UN General Assembly and New York Climate Week. It will feed into the discussions that will take place later this year. And I think the voices of what used to be known as the small island states, but are now positioning themselves as the, the big ocean islands, uh, the other parts of the world are really demanding mm -hmm. that the global north starts making a difference in terms of the contribution that it is being that it that it makes to those that are suffering most on uh, from a climate change perspective we've waited far too long for that climate finance to come together that's been promised for well over a decade i think there will be a push this year but whether governments around the world make that push um, really have to question that and I think this is where other initiatives including financial regulators mm -hmm. with that um, ability to underpin investments needs to again be strengthened and I think another area we where governments can help is shifting grants mm -hmm. so what is effectively giving money away into guarantees so underpinning mm -hmm. those investments crowding in that private sector finance, mm. uh, allowing the money that um, otherwise would be spent on a project to only be used mm. when it is needed because uh, an investment has failed. And I think that is another mechanism that we could and should see more of to mm. speed up what needs to happen this decade. So some great examples there of risk sharing. Absolutely. Um, well, look, just to round off this uh, section, um, Emma, could you perhaps share with everyone in the room just one thing that you would really like people to think about? Um, food for thought. The trouble is with that one thing <laughs> question is there is never just one thing. So I think I have to answer it by saying you have to put environment, nature, into the heart of decision-making. If I look at some of the countries that are literally one event away, one cyclone, one typhoon, one flood away from total devastation, take Fiji, um, Cyclone Winston in 2016 wiped out over 30% of GDP in about 36 hours. They have environment, climate change, nature in the heart of their treasury. That's when we get there. That's mm -hmm. when we know that everybody, whether it's a finance director, a finance minister, is thinking about these mm -hmm. things in the way that is most relevant to their investment decisions, the way they are managing their organization, their department, their country. It's mm -hmm. when it's sitting in finance and is absolutely joining up um, lives, livelihoods, and nature. Mm -hmm. And that is where we have to, again, move at pace. Thank you. Great call to action. Um, thank you so much, Emma, um, for this uh, really insightful um, commentary and really looking forward to carrying on the conversation with the rest of the panel. But before we do, just going to hand over to Steph to introduce everyone. So thank you so much to Emma and Josephine, who we'll hear more from in a moment. Um, it is clear that we need to better understand the value of nature and invest in biodiversity and natural capital, as nature is going to have a pivotal role in meeting the world's net zero commitments. My name is Stephanie Glover. Um, I am Guernsey Finance's Head of Strategy and Sustainable Finance. I am delighted to see you all here today. I hope that you find today's sessions engaging, informative, and maybe even a little inspiring. For our next session, Business Opportunities in Biodiversity Finance, Josephine will continue to moderate as Emma is joined by three more guests. We have Ollie Hughes, Managing Director of Forestry at Gresham House. Ollie and the Forestry Fund at Gresham House really demonstrate how natural capital, cap, natural capital assets can make for great investable opportunities. He is responsible for managing the growth and development of Gresham House's forestry activities, including acquisitions, fund and private client management, and forestry asset management. Ninka Vries also joins the panel as nature and biodiversity strategy specialist at PwC Netherlands. 
Linka brings deep technical and practical insights into biodiversity action for businesses and for investments. This is done through her work with the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures and with PwC as a global biodiversity and nature community of practice. Finally, we have Emma Tuvi, Ecology Director at the Environment Bank. Emma and the Environment Bank are doing pioneering work delivering nature restoration at scale across England. Emma works with ecology experts delivering an extensive network of habitat creation projects across England. These enable developers to meet their biodiversity net gain requirements. Please welcome all to the stage and let's get going. Well, welcome to you all. Thanks for being here today. Um, Linka, I'd like to start with you, uh, if we can. Um, you've heard from Emma some of the financial innovations taking place. Um, how do we more broadly, when we look at the financial system, build the financial in infrastructure um, that will mobilize investment into biodiversity more quickly? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take time. <laughs> uh, I think. In terms of starting point, even, even before getting technical and all the needs and capability building that we're going to get to, um, you, you need an understanding of why, not only out of the kindness of your own heart, but why you're getting moving. So to me, what was very illustrative um, is there was this scientific research done by Naturales, which is a biodiversity center in the Netherlands, my home. And they have done research, very simple, on pollination services and the value that these bring to an apple, uh, blueberries, a watermelon, simply by putting around a bag. So they sealed one apple, they left the other one to open air and pollination. And they determined that the value of one apple to an extent of 50% came from those pollination services. If you take that to a watermelon, that's up to 95%. That to me resonated in terms of its quite direct value, uh, and it's also therefore quite a direct risk. Um, and then if we're looking more at the financial services, I think that is a starting point, understanding not only that there is a dependency on nature or on nature and nature services, but that it's going to hit you and, and how it's going to affect your portfolios, where it's going to hit you. Yeah, that's a really nice uh, example. Um, how do you think we connect that to financial understanding. Yeah. How do we build that bridge? Yeah. So um, there, I, I think you're, you are going to get your, your impact assessments and looking at that risk picture. You, of course, regulation is going to play a part in that, not only in terms of standards that are going to be set or go, that are going to be uh, compulsory, but also in offering guidance. I think what was already mentioned, it's quite hard to grasp. It's also uh, still... It's, it's almost a segmented topic, as you mentioned, so tackle it in that way as well. G uh, regulation and these also voluntary standards, they can play a role in that, I think, as well. Um, to get that, that, that grip almost mm -hmm. uh, as a starting point and then to get going. That being said, it will be, um, you will be falling <laughs> yeah. in a sense. So I think it is about taking that first step and then you might get shot at in terms of you're not doing that right, but that's also going to offer you that guidance to get going ahead. Thank you. Um, so it feels like risk really is underpinning or at least um, lighting the fire under uh, the financial response as a starting point to better assess risk within biodiversity loss and uh, to understand what that means for us. I mean, Ollie, um, if I could come to you, um, do you think the full extent of nature-related financial risk is really understood? Um, at risk of... Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at yeah. risk of um, answering it very quickly, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think, yeah. um, I think what we've really got to work on, um, and, and apologies, I'll be unashamedly focused on forestry, which is what I do, but um, what we've got to work on is, is how we can uh, ensure that that risk is understood, that that risk is... Um, brought to the front and with anything financial everybody understands as soon as your risk is understood then your your reward can be understood and your measurement can be understood and then you can mm -hmm. then take a decision and you can move money and and i think um you know one thing i'm 
you know, I think it's fantastic we talk about biodiversity today, but is making sure that that interdependency of what mm -hmm. we're talking about between biodiversity, between climate change and carbon, and most of all between society, how they all link and how they all interlink and how they actually work together. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't get them right, and we see this all the time in our field, you know, we have within forestry, and we can talk about that later, but within forestry we have a very large pile of capital that is looking to invest in forestry, but struggles. It struggles to deploy. It's struggling to find places to invest and to, to make that right. So, so we've really got to, to work through that. So that's, you know, the interdependency. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is, is that there's two sides of this risk as well. There's one, the risk side of, do people really understand the underlying risk of biodiversity and the effects thereon to the investments that they are already in, which Emma has outlined extremely well and, and, and passionately. The other side is, is if you are then looking at opportunities to invest in environmental opportunity, what are the risks associated there? And I think if you can then flip those so you've got you know, a regulatory risk of a, what, there may be a decision today to do something which you might back and then that might change. So you've got to always take that into account. There is then the market risk of, well, what will be the value of that and how does that evolve over time? There is then an operating risk with, can you deliver what you are hoping to deliver at the beginning and will the outcome be? And we were talking earlier, but you know, we will trip over these things, but mm. we've got to understand what those are. And then finally, there's that reputational risk of, is this the right thing to be doing? Do you have the mandate to do it? And, um, and then once you've got your head around those two sides of the equation, then I think, Anything like this has to have a financial reasoning to drive the real capital towards a, to, to a destination, I think. Yeah. And do you think it's helpful that the central banks are looking at scenario testing around some of these risks, specifically now as it relates to biodiversity? Is that going to socialise uh, our it's, understanding? It's, it's absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, without mm -hmm. that, without that underlying mm -hmm. dependence and without that underlying mandate, none of this can, can really move forwards. And... And I think the key is, is driving that right balance between regulatory incentive, mm -hmm. mandated incentive, um, to make sure that private capital and capital is, is mm. deployed. Because I do not feel, especially within the current environmental, um, economic environment, that we can continue to constantly look at government to support and to, to drive mm. these things. It's got to be social, private capital, and people understanding that risk and that opportunity to deploy capital into these sectors. So it's absolutely key that, mm. you know, that underpinning yeah. regulatory um, endorsement is there. And one of the things um, Descupta had noted in his review was the need for better governance models. So if we have got better risk frameworks in place and we are driving um, at better quality data relating to biodiversity loss, um, he was referring to the fact that we need the right skill sets and the right places to be able to analyse that risk. So there was a, a, a large emphasis on education, both within the financial sector and outside of it. Yep. What are your thoughts? Certainly across our portfolio, we are really actively engaged. We're actively mm -hmm. mandated by our investors to enhance, to invest, and to deliver mm -hmm. better biodiversity. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what that benchmark and that measurement is. Mm -hmm. And we're spending an awful lot of time. We've appointed consultants to, to build us a baseline benchmark within our forestry investments. We have done um, eDNA ED studies and surveys across our portfolios, across mm -hmm. our forests, across benchmark um, controls. Um, and you know, we're looking at all of these ways to actually create those benchmarks to be able to then manage. Once you measure, you manage. And I think the, the launch of the, the, T, the Task Force of Nature and Financial Disclosure, I think, is absolutely key in creating those benchmarks mm -hmm. to support that. Because, you know, we, we, we are willing buyers, as it were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we really want to deliver this and create this outcome, but we're not quite sure where. Now, mm -hmm. we may be looking in the wrong places, which is partly why I'm here, to find <laughs> out, you know, yeah. what, what other places we can be looking at. But mm -hmm. that is a fundamental problem. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, again, you have this, this tension, which is driven mainly by the social mandate of an environment where one person's view on X will be very different from another person's view on Y. And consequently, mm -hmm. the outcome, nothing happens at all. Yeah. And so we've got to work out how we prioritize and balance those. And then you can only do that if you've got underlying measurement and data, I think. Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad you mentioned frameworks, because that brings me back to Ninka. Um, it, could you um, just give us your views on how frameworks will, well, both the mandated and voluntary frameworks will assist us in addressing some of these risks that Ollie's talking about and some of the market failures um, Descupta has talked about? Yeah, I think a funny, I mean, Ali then is talking about eDNA and missing a benchline, et cetera. That, that's in terms of maturity, I think, already very advanced. Um, I think what these frameworks, whether voluntary or mandated, can, can also help in is, is that guidance. So where do we even start, let alone eDNA? But what do we start with? What do we have to map for ourselves? What is it that our organization needs to get involved with? And also in terms of materiality, do we focus our efforts on the right, uh, in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is, is something like the TNFD, but also other standards coming up, uh, and even regulation, that... Um, tries to direct that process, and I think it never fully uh, fills it out uh, for companies. So it's, it will set recommendations, it will set that direction, but there is multiple ways of addressing it, and I think that's, that's because of that biodiversity being such a multifaceted theme, um, mm -hmm. and, and almost being siloed and, and being different for ev from every organization, for every location, um, you need that, that margin also to mm -hmm. fill that in yourself. Could you talk us through perhaps some of the uh, work you've been doing in the, the build of the TNFD? Yeah, so uh, the TNFD is, is a market-led initiative um, where you, you're basically creating the, the framework to disclose on nature-related risks and opportunities. It is based entirely on that idea or that notion of double materiality. So in one way, business is going to impact nature, and the other way is that nature impacts business. So there is impacts, there is dependencies, and co um, uh, therefore also risks and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it's an iterative process, so it was launched for the first time, the first beta version in March. But what you're seeing now is that it's really maturing into more practical guidance, and that is mm -hmm. what is so much needed. So you're getting these sector-specific guidance, you're getting scenario analysis, first drafts edit, and that I think is, is imperative for any progress at all. Um, is there gonna be feedback? Absolutely, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, but just to kind of see not only what in theory should happen, but also what in practice can happen. And that I think is, is a major leap if not addressed, which I'm happy to see that in TNFD um, is working towards more and more. Yeah. And how developed um the methodologies for really understanding the gathering of baseline data? <laughs> well, Ollie. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that depends on your goal with it as well, I would argue. Um, because if you're straight away taking that reporting angle and an auditable reporting angle, I am PwC, then your standards are going to be even even, uh, well, far, far higher in that sense. Mm -hmm. What it should never do, however, is avoid you from taking any action whatsoever. So take those first steps, get what is out there, get what you can start from, even if that's just basic insights or a basic direction uh, of impacts and dependencies, get going, figure out what is happening. Also, the market is moving in a rapid pace, not only from these initiatives and standards, but also in terms of suppliers. Um, so, mm -hmm. so don't wait for that all to finalize, but get going, mm -hmm. and then the reporting will come afterwards. And do you think we're challenged because a lot of these assessments are done at the local level, but we need to elevate them up to a sort of national and then global understanding? The challenge of comparability then uh, on what's working, what's not working. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Diverse, to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> because what I would never want to do is, is to almost give, well, to, to give too generic an answer, completely disregarding that local factor. So I understand why you do get initiatives going at a local scale, not only because it has to start somewhere, because, but also because the impacts differ um, mm -hmm. per region. So I think that makes sense, and there always has to be margin to account for that. What I do think is that in order for it to become an investable market also, you need a form of transparency and you also need a form of uh, consistency. Whether that is at localized levels, that's fine, but you will need the two. And I'm sure all this data will help through into 
evolving valuation methodologies around you know, natural capital premium, if you can call it that. Um, Ollie, then, back to you. Um, what is the role of forestation and afforestation um, and associated ecosystem services um, in biodiversity enha and enhancement and decarbonisation? Yep. So this is where I go on to full sell, because I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> passionate that forestry has a role to play. Um, and it has been doing that for some time. Um, but I think we're changing and we're evolving as a sector. Um, and this is, you know, and I'm, with, I'm sort of very much focusing on productive forestry here. And it's creating that link and that interdependency between producing a long-term sustainable material supply, creating carbon sequestration opportunities, and doing that in a sustainable and biodiverse way, which can bring those all together and then linking that into your local communities so that they are also benef benefiting from that environment. And that is absolutely doable in forestry. Mm. Um, and so, you know, what we've got to do is stop skulking around in the shadows, which we have done historically, trying to um, be as low impact as possible and saying, well, forestry has got a very low impact and actually flip that on its head and start to say, actually, we've got to be high impact. We've got to generate an outcome that is bringing together all of those key factors. And, and the reason I talk about inter that interdependency is we've recently published a report sort of last year on, on the future demand for timber, which must be one of the best alternative sustainable supplies to concrete and steel. Um, and we're seeing that timber demand and timber consumption is going to increase by somewhere in the region of four times by 2050, set against a sustainable supply which is almost flat. Um, so if we don't do something about it, we don't do that in that combined um, environment, then, then it's going to create a transfer of issue and a transfer of problem. If you just look at the UK, we're already importing 80% of our timber. So we've got to work out ways of how we mm -hmm. deliver this sustainably. So what you can do and how forestry can work on that is, in current planting schemes, for example, in the UK, or in, uh, or in um, New Zealand or Australia where we are, when we take a planting area, we would probably only plant about 60 to 70% 70 of that area in productive timber, as we would call it. We will have species diversification in that. We will remain 30% area would be broad leaves, it would have broad leaves and open ground for purely for biodiversity purposes. So what we're already doing is building in landscape scale, environmental <laughs> biodiverse scenery. Now, what we've got to do is say, is that enough? And that's where this measurement comes in. And we can then drive a combination of underlying returns. So our funds over the last decade have returned double-digit returns to investors, alongside an enhancement of biodiversity, alongside an ability to be able to deploy capital and to provide positive environmental upgrade to, to local communities. And that's jobs, and that's access to, to forestry and forest areas. So, I think forestry has a huge opportunity mm. to play, and it gives you that balance of financial gain and control. Now, it's also important that it's done in the right places, um, you know, and it is not the, the panacea to everything. We've got to have, and it's oft used at the moment, but the right tree in the right place. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that we carpet the, the country or the world with X, Y, or Z species. We've got to make sure that it is sympathetically thought through. But it has to have an underlying balance. And forestry can bring that. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, um, and I think you know, we are now managing funds in excess of three billion in forestry alone. That is real capital deployment, I think. So. And how well understood do you think it is um, the place of forestry has within the solution set as we get to... Um, net zero, because it, it at times, it, you know, it touches on controversy, doesn't it, when trees are chopped down. So that point you were making about its use as a, an alternate source to steel and concrete, this, yeah. its place within the supply chain there within other sectors. There's, there's, a, there's a double point to... to the, so education people have got to look... The, these, these are mm. things that have got to transition long term. Mm. And I think there's a potential misalignment, and we're not talking about carbon today, but there's a misalignment within carbon of what forestry can do. And people, we have endless investors coming to us and saying, we've got a carbon net zero plan by 2030, and we would like to include forestry within that plan. And we're going, well, 
you know, by 2030, the trees are going to be about this big, and they're not going to have actually really sequestered very much carbon at all. Mm -hmm. So within that, you've got to be looking at it at a much larger scale. But we have a climate emergency. We need to be doing things now. We need to be making and anticipating changes. So, so there's an enormous amount of education in that, but it's also got to come within that balance. And, and this isn't a binary outcome. It's not plant trees. Mm -hmm. It's not all about biodiversity. It's making sure that we interlink these together and deliver mm -hmm. financial, sustainable opportunities, I think. This is where, if I could, mm -hmm. may come in, there's the, this point about getting the environmental regulators, and I don't just mean the Environment Agency, I mean all of the different environmental regulators mm -hmm. working with the financial regulators so that it is that the, the positives and the negatives are much, much better understood. Mm -hmm. And uh, of, often the financial regulators are just not engaging with the um, real economy regulators. And this is where we need to speed up those discussions because none mm -hmm. of this is straightforward, but we have to go head on to some of the, where the contention is so that we mm -hmm. make sure that we don't have unintended consequences in the way people are investing. It can be mm. sorted and the right kind of investors will want to sort things out if things go wrong. And just, just as an example, we have a target in the UK to plant 30,000 hectares per year. Yeah. Okay, that's funded, it's all targeted. Last year we planted about 14,000 hectares. In the UK, all of that was in Scotland. None in England, none in Wales. And so why? It's all because mm. there's regulatory seizure and so if you bring together those various parts, Mm -hmm. There will be outcome. Um, and it, it may not be perfect, but the, we, we've got to start making those steps, I think. And do you think there's the community support within England it's, it's, there it's, as it's, well? It's all educational. Mm -hmm. It's all yeah. getting people to understand what is right, wh where it's wrong. You know, we flip from being, I hate to say it, but from heroes to villains regularly. You know, mm. for one minute we're, we're planting trees, we're sequestering carbon, we're doing good things. The next we're planting a monoculture, we're driving farmers off land. You know, this debate has got to be had. We've got to understand where the right places to do these things are. And if we look at the... I mean, we spoke earlier about the revenue stack when we were having yeah. uh, coffee, um, but if you look at the different types of revenue stream that can be associated with uh, the, the enhancement of the landed footprint of a forest, can you talk about some of the things that you're seeing evolve? You might have a view, Emma, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I start, and then that will segue nicely yeah. onto Emma, yeah. because so, so effectively within our revenue streams, and this is where we're really we're struggling, to be honest with you, because within our revenue streams, we start with timber revenue. That's mm -hmm. 35, 40 years out. You've then got carbon revenues, but there is an uncertainty over carbon structuring, carbon uh, verification, carbon ruling. Over the, uh, globally, there are endless different forms of carbon, but anyway, there is a market there, and that, that will... You've then got flood prevention, You've then got water purification. Um, you've then got what we hope is biodiversity and ecology credits and biodiversity net gain. And that's where we, when we're looking at opportunities, we've got to start looking at how we layer these opportunities on top of each other to deliver financial returns that then become um, incentivizing to deploy capital. Um, and that's where regulation and that's where direction comes in because left to your own devices, those things in a capital market will err towards necessarily not where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So we've got to work out how we, 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 we balance those. But there is mm -hmm. a revenue stack, and that mm -hmm. biodiversity is now a reality um, yeah. in the UK. And do you think a carbon tax is a silver bullet, golden bullet? It, within a structured mm -hmm. market, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you look at compliance markets yeah. like New Zealand, yeah. Um, they have got a very stable carbon structure now, which is which is enabling the government to turn up the carbon tax and to, to deliver an outcome. Yeah. Voluntary credits within their own right will have a positive if you've got a, a, a financial environment that is you know willing to do things for the purposes of mm -hmm. you know progress rather than because it's being forced. And married against incentives. I don't know if anyone's got a view on that. The stick of the tax versus incentives to encourage investment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm, I missed. Um, 
Thank so you. I was just, uh, yeah, Sorry. I was just, uh, I was just uh, uh, sort of balancing um, the effectiveness from a policy perspective of a carbon tax against the 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 role of incentives to encourage investment into new areas. Um, yeah, big big question there. Mm. I mean, in terms of biodiversity itself, mm. like we've we've been in this a space where public sector sort of stewardship funding mm -hmm. has tried to incentivize landowners to do positive pos positive things for biodiver biodiversity over decades now and we've mm -hmm. still seen these catastrophic losses um, and significant you know the 60 percent decline in species since um, the 70s so whilst I absolutely agree there's a space for that I think we need a wholesale change in terms of how we <clears throat> genuinely and tangibly deliver nature recovery at the scale that we really need it to to make a difference in this kind of short period mm. of time that we actually mm. have now to to have an impact so I think it's a bit of both yeah <laughs> yeah generally and um, just tell us about some of the work the Environment Bank is doing sure absolutely so I mean as mentioned already, so biodiversity net gain is a new mandatory requirement that's coming in since the sort of royal assent of the Environment Bill that came in last year and as of uh, autumn next year, all developments across England um, are going to be required to deliver a biodiversity uplift um, at least 10% mm -hmm. um, as part of that kind of planning consenting regime. Um, so. <clears throat> some developers are able to deliver that within their red line boundaries of their development schemes, but in, in the main, it's not possible to deliver that um, on site. And so we at Environment Bank are offering a, a neat solution for developers to invest in biodiversity net gain delivery off site. So we're essentially s establishing a network of what we call habitat banks, which are essentially a large scale habitat creation, nature recovery projects all across England, and we're doing that, at least one in every local planning authority mm -hmm. area. Um, and we do that in a collaborative way. We work with stakeholders, other beneficiaries within the landscape, um, and we put the right habitats where they should be, the right tree in the right place. Um, and from that, we, you know, the primary driver is biodiversity, not carbon, not anything else. Mm -hmm. But we are seeing significant co-benefits, ancillary benefits to that, um, to these projects, and multiple stakeholders are benefiting from this sort of wider ecosystem services and benefits. Um, and that how do you actually doing. measure the biodiversity? Well, luckily, it's like getting too tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, luckily, because it's a mandatory regime, mm. um, the secondary legislation there's already significant sort of mm. guidance, and the regulatory regime is already becoming established, and it's pretty level playing field. So, mm. in a way, it's much simpler from these kind of the TNFD more complex approach where you're trying to capture impacts and interdependencies from a, a huge range of activities. Here we've got a development in a known ge geography. You know where it's, the impact's going to be and you know where your, essentially your mitigation or offset's going to be. And we um, measure it in a, a... There's a level playing field. We have a government-backed biodiversity metric, mm -hmm. um, which everyone, all the players, whether it's the landowner, whether it's local government, whether it's operators like us, we all use the same metrics. We all use the same methodologies in terms of classifying habitats that are going to be lost and going to be gained. And does that cross national boundaries? Unfortunately not okay. yet. And I think there's, there's a big challenge there. I think a lot of other um, nations, I mean, I suspect in the coming years, Scotland and Wales will seek to adopt a similar regime, but the metrics need to be bespoke to your, to your environment. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the challenges and the the, the value of habitats across England is very different to that seen in Scotland and Wales, so they mm. need to meet the, the local needs. And, and that's mm. the biggest, one of the biggest differences between the carbon market and biodiversity is that geography matters and, yes. and location matters. Which I guess is a baseline for the TNFD. If, if you're localising your assessments, how does that feed up into standardised investment decision-making? You already gave a well a starting point, but uh, the focus has has been quite 
uh, on, on one side of the coin in terms of, you, you called it, uh, so financing green. Uh, I do think, especially when you're looking at TNFD and the challenges, especially for the financial sector, uh, it's on that greening finance side, and then you really get that local component also going mm -hmm. in. So how do we measure that um, if you're looking at, at average size of investments and you're also saying side level is the only way to go, that's going to be an incredible operational burden, and it might not even be proportionate. I'm definitely saying, definitely not saying don't do it, uh, but it's, it's how do we assess whether that makes sense and how do we assess the proper level of aggregation? How do we assess, um, mm -hmm. other than the, the financing green bit, where it might be easier to find that bandage line, you might even opt for eDNA, uh, which is one of the methodologies to really go on site level and get those insights. What works for the rest of it, and how do we make sure it becomes investable in that sense as well? How do companies report on it, mm -hmm. um, not only on what they're doing at the end stage, kind of uh, making sure to bring main nature back or to have that biodiversity net gain, but what are we also doing in terms of maybe not even avoid, because then you're going to get other investable uh, decisions, but what are we doing in terms of minimizing impact, and how do we measure mm -hmm. that? And then I think you're getting to investable decisions when you have those insights. Yes, and it, it's investable if we can value the thing that we're investing in, which sounds so simple, <laughs> but valuing nature. And, and be able to rely on that. Yeah. I mean, there are valuation methodologies uh, developing, of course, but I think the development of bio, uh, BNG, biodiversity net gain credits, um, <laughs> um, helps helps with that because you can attribute a monetary value then to the credit. Can you yes. talk us through that? Yeah. The monetization of the credit. Absolutely. I mean yeah. it's an early obviously an early emerging market, but for us it you know, we are able to cost out these projects. We have we mm. sort of deliver these projects in quite um, prescribed parameters if you like. We know they have to be at least thirty years um, from start to finish, finish as a minimum. Um, we know that they need to be underpinned by quite clear requirements from a legislative, from a kind of um, financial and legal securing the land type perspective, and we're able to cost out those projects from start to finish for the full 30 years. So that, mm -hmm. that helps us to sort of understand what, what the cost is to us in delivering them. But we also, because we because it's all underpinned by these government-backed metrics, we're also it's also clear what yield of units, mm -hmm. you know, that we're going to be able to deliver from these projects per hectare, depending on the habitat types that we, we you know that we're able to achieve on the site, um, and also because it's built um, sort of uh, understood through the ecology lens, um, we're also under able to understand the risks associated with delivering certain types of more complex and challenging land treatments. So all of those things together, actually, they're, they're relatively, I say easy, but they're relatively easy to, to understand um, and cost out. <coughs> so we do have a, you know, we have a price per unit now between 25 and 40 grand per hectare, uh, sorry, per unit, um, and that's based on all of those factors now. That's quite a big swing. Yes, and th and th and that indeed comes basically mm -hmm. because of the need to deliver to understand your local challenges mm -hmm. and risks, but also certain habitat types. The more complex, the more intrinsically complex um, the habitat, the more value it has um, from a biodiversity perspective. But also the more risks and challenges around making sure that you can deliver it to a target mm -hmm. condition over a, a fixed time frame. Um, so that's where the variation comes in. So the more expensive ones are the, those that mm -hmm. are more complex to deliver. And how do you then, having produced a credit then and, and valued the credit, how do you predict demand for the credit? That's, yeah, I mean, so we, we've <laughs> it has been quite difficult, again, because it's really early days mm -hmm. in the market. We've done quite a lot of demand analysis across the UK, um, firstly based on what we know is going to be where the highest development pressures are going to be. Um, so we've worked with FTEC and some other economists on that, and we know per local authority area what level of demand from development pressure over the next mm -hmm. 10 years it, we're likely to see. Um, and also just through engagement with developers themselves and looking at case studies of developments over the past 10 years, what kinds of 
what kind of land and what kinds of habitats and what kinds of impacts are we likely to see based on you know this portfolio of case studies over the last 10 years and using those two bits of information we've got a feel for the demand for units um, yeah coming up and I, I guess with the rollout of TNSD um, which will impact corporates over time having to report on their biodiversity footprints. Do you see that as a new market then for? Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, so we're already working with a range of organizations that are seeking to, to for an H positive outcome, and they're already looking at ways to obviously reduce and avoid their own impacts on um, biodiversity and through their value chain, but also looking to invest in um, regenerative and nature recovery projects sort of aside from understand their impacts but having a posit nature positive journey and start that journey now so yeah we're working with organisations for a kind of bespoke product um, for them that meets their needs and we can because there's so many transferable learning points from the BNG sector we're able to, we know how to measure, we know how to assess our land, we know how to create great habitats in the right place. Mm. Um, and yeah, we can see that as, a, uh, as the next a big new thing. Market. Yeah. And, and would they be valued in the same way? There's the big question. Ollie, <laughs> 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 well, might have a few on that. Is a newt worth more than that? <laughs> well, this is, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how that works. It's who yeah. prioritises which... I mean, biodiversity level. In yeah, I mean, in the mandat obviously in a mandatory regime, mm -hmm. there's a lot of value attributed just simply because it, it has to happen mm -hmm. and it has to happen in a certain way. I think in the voluntary re um, regime, there are different questions around. It's more about how who benefits and what does the beneficiary, how does the beneficiary value those biodiversity outcomes instead of necessarily how much it's costing me to deliver it. And so there's some, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to be done in that space, I think. And if you look at the, the forward curve for the price uh, of these credits, do you think it will follow the same trajectory as carbon? I hope, um, I, hope so. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I mean, at, at the moment, the biodiversity unit value is obviously significantly more than a carbon a carbon unit. Um, I think there is a risk that in the voluntary in a voluntary regime with biodiversity credits, that there will be a similar, without wishing to use the wrong phrase, but you know. A, a variety of options out there of, of varying sort of legitimacy and quality, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, and, and therefore, I'm, I have absolutely no doubt that there'll be a biodiversity credit out there that um, you can buy for not very much money. But the question is, what, what value does it have? What's, is it underpinned by, you know, good governance? Is it underpinned by good s sort of legal structures that ensure that it's being delivered? Is it being monitored? Um, I think all these questions will be answered by, you know, what, what, what ex what's expected of the TNFD sort of outcomes and what, what's going to be expected of organisations to disclose and demonstrate tangibly. Yeah. Um, so it feels like we have a, a sort of regulatory regime that is, is price, uh, placing a price, if you like, on biodiversity enhancement. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a, a framework developing that will... Um, assist with us, assist with it. Um, it doesn't seem to tackle the core issue that Descopta um, raised around the, you know, does nature itself have intrinsic value? Uh, and if we're to, to value it uh, as we would any other asset and bring it onto our balance sheets, um, you know, what, what do we need to do to, to shift the financial system um, into that sort of place? So we have got certain initiatives like the Natural Capital Protocol um, and, and at the, uh, I think there's other accounting initiatives that are looking to, to place a value uh, on natural um, capital. Um, I mean, Oli, how, how, how do you see that evolving? Is it realistic to think that we can value nature as an asset or is it are we always going to have to fall back onto regulation and frameworks that force us to do things I, we've seen some really interesting land 
mm. transfer pricing going on um, all over the world, but you know, especially in the UK, which has been driven by natural capital and mm. natural environment without any ostensible underlying framework of, of, of stack of, 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 of revenue, as we were talking mm. about before, which mm. to me suggests that, yes, and that's not purely philanthropic, that is large-scale mm. institutional funds buying these mm. landowners, which would suggest that there will be a market because the value mm. of something will be defined mm. in pure capitalist terms as by what people are willing to pay for it. Mm. And so I think there may be a transition where things like forestry will, will be real asset investments, yeah. which will have long-term cash flows attached to them, which will yeah. have a variety of different biodiversity factors, yeah. um, capital fa carbon factors and, and mm. timber factors, as we were talking about. Yeah. But there will be pure natural capital, which I think will potentially find a benchmark value on what someone is willing to pay for. Yeah. And, and you're that's seeing starting that to happen. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, so you're seeing that flow through into land valuations yeah, already? Absolutely. Okay. And whether it's in peat or whether it's in upland area, and it's being predominantly driven philanthropically at the moment, but I think yeah. that will, will, will move forward. I hope. I don't know what other views are. I think we've got to be really careful with uh, our, our investment decisions on, on, and on whose behalf they're being mm. made. So I can, I can see with pension funds where you've got multiple beneficiaries and this is being shared and is seen to be equitable, I can see that being mm. a direction which is much more positive than what might otherwise be seen as a land grab. I think we've got to come back mm. to the way nature, the climate, uh, doesn't see borders and doesn't see any differences between indiv in individuals. And we've got to make sure that we are investing for the long term for all mm. and not for the few. I totally agree, but the problem we have there is then the pension investors are going, well, that's my pension you're taking a view on which will potentially have a lower outcome if I hadn't invested in, I don't know, something else. So it's, it's finding where, who leads that. And I think if people are willing to lead that mm -hmm. from, a, from mm -hmm. a philanthropic view, that's great if it's building a market and building a pricing and a benchmark pricing. It's but about I building totally, a world yeah. where we can all retire into. And I think, it, so it is, it's yeah, taking it yeah. to a, a very different approach. But I, I think uh, ultimately that's where we collectively have to um, take this conversation, that it's not just yeah. about delivering returns for the few. Yeah. And that's the holistic approach you sort of started with, then, there, isn't it? You know, the, the connectivity between policy and regulation and the, the financial system. Yeah. I think um, if we brought some yeah. of our future generations or our past generations into this conversation right now, they may be thinking, mm. where is this going? And, uh, yeah, w w if you look at Pakistan, um, a third of the country underwater, the size of Portugal, and you think about a just transition to this future world, we need to be thinking about how just this is for, for everybody. Otherwise, we'll be putting up borders, and that might be a very different world that we're choosing to invest into for the future. And maybe to add, just um, this valuation of nature will, will take a while in terms of mm. uh, possibly never fully wrapping up that discussion and fully agreeing. I think it should never be an inhabilitating factor. So even if we do not have the full um, financial value picture of nature yet, it should never be a reason to not start. So in terms of risk valuation, there are very, very definite numbers already. Um, mm. And that is, I mean, it was already mentioned at the rates we're going right now. Mm. Um, the, the financing gap was addressed, so currently being at about 130 130 billion a year needs to be up in about 150 billion US dollars a year. Mm -hmm. That number is only going to increase mm -hmm. um, if mm -hmm. we continue to deteriorate. So in, in terms of that gap and the risk valuation we already have, let's, I think that those will be very also in terms of for financial industry. Um, those are numbers, hard numbers to already go by and to at least get moving. And it was the Dutch um, central bank that did an analysis of its portfolio, isn't it? That I think they determined they had 510 billion at stake yeah. based on a 36% of the portfolio. Yeah, correct. Um, 
so you could see the central banks really moving on this and, and, and the, the banking system really asking their, in, you know, the, their loan books to disclose and ensure that they've got effective strategies in place around their yeah. biodiversity. And, and there's even some calls now already for central banks and supervisors to almost uh, consider it as, well, in, in similar ways as uh, the financial crisis, mm -hmm. as the pandemic, but to consider it a crisis and get it up and running to make sure it was already addressed before. You're, you're, there's, uh, risks or there's systemic risks also mm -hmm. at play. And those, we haven't reached the tipping point yet. We haven't reached that systemic risk, but they are a realistic scenario. And I think there is a way, if we're talking about that, I was announced be, uh, in, in terms of operational perspective, that steps like, okay, what can we already to do to also avoid that systemic mm -hmm. risk um, and, and different types of systemic risks mm -hmm. and also make sure that that financing gap doesn't exceed uh, yeah. what it already quite significantly uh, is at now. Thank you. Um, Emma, you, you sort of raised, um, just in the answer to the previous question, um, an obligation to think about the next um, generation, which I, I really liked. Um, perhaps as we round up this session, um, you could share thoughts with us about where you'd like to see us in 2030, 2050, which, which requires us then to think about not only our leaders of tomorrow, but the, the, the environment that we're leaving. Well, the 2030 agenda, the 2030 timeline, which has been very much introduced with net zero thinking, I think is just as relevant for nature and nature dependency. And that is about getting on track for this world that we all need to be living in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, with the different interventions, the different initiatives, with the different ideas that different panelists have mm. talked about gives me hope that a lot of energy a lot of thinking is to go go going into the, the solutions I think we've just got to constantly remind ourselves that when it comes to a wildfire when it comes to a flood when it comes to a heat wave we're all in this together and we've got to be thinking um, about how we are applying capital in a way that is uh, investing in a future world and have that at the back of our mind. There's, I have no um, difficulties with people making returns in their investments, but ultimately when this really gets tricky mm -hmm. and um, we, we've, we've talked about how we know uh, the risks from nature depletion we know that many portfolios are currently investing in a world that is not worth living with in terms mm -hmm. of the temperatures that will arise from those portfolios that we've got to collectively apply our um, best thinking our best practical solutions so that we are literally investing in a world worth living in that will have returns as well yeah. thank you well on that note thank you thank you to our panel um, really grateful for all of your insights thank you Thank you very much to all of our panellists for their input there. It's definitely clear there are real investable opportunities to protect nature, such as Ollie's uh, double-digit returns in forestry. But frameworks, methodologies, governance models will be needed to scale up and encourage institutional investment into this pivotal area of finance. While, as Emma Howard-Boyd said, protecting nature and the people who live within it um, is completely necessary for that just transition to a net-zero economy. It's now time for our first coffee break of the afternoon. Our coffee sponsor today is KPMG. On your table, you will find a sustainable and reusable coffee cup. This is a gift for you to take away today, as well as using, your, using during your coffee break. During the break, please can you also open Slido on your phone and using the code WEARESUSTAINABLE, which is all one word, to answer a poll question which will be discussed during the next session. Please enjoy the refreshments and we look forward to seeing you back here in half an hour's time.